Jashi miss you? You know those guys? Okay, okay. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Abu Yasir? I don't know. I just know. I know. I know the other brother. Okay, Chef, you take keys. Is the Adhan? So the Adhan is what time? Okay, the Adhan is what time? The Adhan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد we just completed for the most part the issue of some of the أحكام connected with the adab of the mobile phone and as I mentioned there are many things that can be said but we don't have a whole lot of time so we have to make اختصار and choose some of the things that we think people will find it easy to engage in, they can do it, and everybody will get the reward. But there is one other issue we have to mention concerning the telephone, that is the problem and the izaj and the noise that the telephone creates in the masjid. I think uh, there's not a salat that we pray, except that at some point, some telephone is going to go off and it's going to disrupt the people who are praying. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he went to great lengths to make it so that the masjid was clear of any unnecessary noise that would take away from the concentration of the people who were praying. Because the primary role and the primary objective of the masjid is for people to pray. It is not for the izaj of the people or the the noise, the unnecessary noise. There's some noise that's just necessary, like the crying of children, for an example. We just have to deal with that, but it's the unnecessary noise. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to prohibit the people from reading the Quran out loud in the masjid so as not to disturb people who are praying. For an example, other people were reading. Everybody... Someone's car is blocking uh, right here in the car park. Somebody's car. It's a box, box hall. Someone's car, box hall. Zafira is blocking people right here. Akramakullahi akhi. So he, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, will prevent the people, as I mentioned, from doing a number of things. And from these things can be included what we have with the problem of the telephone ringing. So the imam, if he doesn't tell the people to turn off the telephone, then at some point someone's telephone is going to go off. And even if he told the people to turn the telephones off or the people of the masjid posted it around different strategic places in the masjid, the, mis the, the telephones are still going to go off. So we shouldn't make al izaj and al adha for the believers, as the Nabi mentioned, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, la tuvu ibadullah. Don't annoy the Muslims. People trying to pray, focus, concentrate on their prayer. The noises go off the telephone. It is a big distraction. It's a big problem. So that's something we want to bring to the people's attention. That I think it's probably in our best interest when a person comes to the masjid if he can. Just turn off the telephone altogether during the time that he's in the masjid so that it doesn't become a distraction because it's a big distraction. Other issue about the masjid, and we mentioned this one time in one of our classes, is about the individual who brings his telephone to the masjid and he uses the electricity of the masjid to charge his phone up. And this is something that should be avoided unless the person absolutely is going to face some emergency. He has to get from here to somewhere else. He has to catch a bus, a train. He's in a foreign city and he happens to go to the masjid to pray and his phone is dying. The battery of the phone is dying. In those dire circumstances, he can use the electricity of the masjid. But the electricity of the masjid 
is part of the waqf of the masjid. It's an endowment. And any endowment, you can't treat the endowment the way you want to treat it. The chairs that are here, I can't just take this chair home and just bring it home and use the chair because it is an endowment that has been dedicated and gifted to the masjid. The mushaf, can't take the Quran and take it out of here and bring it home. Even if it wasn't my need, it's not my intent to take it and steal it and keep it, you shouldn't take it out of the masjid. There are ahkam, rules and regulations that are in place. What can you do with an endowment? Something that has been given strictly and solely for Allah Azza wa So the individual who leaves, for an example, a farm, land of a farm, has apples growing there, grapes growing there. You can't just go into that place and eat from and utilize the produce of that place because it's an endowment. It's a waqf. The masjid is the same way. Can't take the money out of the masjid like that unless it's, as I mentioned, dire straits. Islam doesn't want your life to be unnecessarily complicated and it says to you, let your battery die and you miss your transportation you don't get back to your city. Islam doesn't say that. If you have those dire straits, permissible. Other than that, don't bring your shahin to the masjid with your telephone and charge your telephone in the masjid. You're taken from the monies of the masjid. I think all of you are aware of the famous story of Umar, Allah Azza wa Jal Alam, as it relates to the sihah of the story. But they said historically, Umar was on a level of wara, where when he was doing the business of the Muslims, he wouldn't waste anything that came out of the Baytul Mal. If it was doing the business for the Muslims, he would use it. But if it was on his own personal business, he wouldn't use it. To the point of lighting his candle or not lighting his candle. If he had his candle at home, he used this candle at home. He didn't bring the candle that was supplied by the masjid or by the monies of the Muslim when it was in his or for his personal benefit. So the telephone in the masjid is a serious issue because, again, it has been a distraction. Our mother Aisha, radwanullahi alayha, she was praying or she gave and she made some type of qumash or a sitar, a, a curtain. And on that curtain, there were some patterns that made images and pictures. When the Prophet was praying in his house, the Sunnah prayer, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he saw what was on there, he told him to take it down because it preoccupied him from the Salat, made his concentration on his prayer, took it away from him some bit. And he told us about the prayer, Inna Fis Salati La Shura. The prayer is something that people are already preoccupied. You don't need anything extra. Shaitan, Iblis, Khanzeb comes. He's a problem. Things that are going around in the masjid, problems. So this is one of the issues that should be avoided. As it relates Ikhwani, to the second aspect of our presentation, many of our youngsters are really deeply engrossed in this issue of social media. And many of us people who are from the older generation, we don't even have a full concept about everything that's out there. I mean, personally, I don't know most of the stuff that's out there beyond Facebook, beyond Twitter, Periscope. I don't know those other things that are out there. And there are a lot. And the religion didn't make it obligatory upon older people to come to know about all of that. But we should have some kind of idea what our youth are up to, what our children are up to. Because it has become easy for a young person to be involved and to delve into kabair, things that can destroy the individual, destroy the society right under the noses of people who are supervising them because we don't have knowledge about that particular issue. So a lot can be said about this. But again, due to the strengths on the time, we're going to mention a few things. But I think it's only pertinent to give the other bright side of the story. There's no doubt that there is a lot of benefit in social media. A lot of benefit. It is a medium and a forum in which we can give dawah in Allah in a way you couldn't give dawah before. 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had he had these things at his disposal, only Allah knows how this religion would have spread. Because him coming from the humble environment that he came from, and he spread the religion all the way to Europe, because they were very serious about practicing Islam and spreading Islam and defending Islam, although they had a little in their hands, they accomplished a lot. So what would he have been able to accomplish had he had all of these things at his disposal for the dawah? Back then, he would send one of his companions with a letter that he wrote. A letter. Someone would write a letter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is from Muhammad. Accept Islam, you'll be saved. Accept Islam, you get the reward that your people will receive as a result of Islam. And that was it. The man would read the letter. When the companion would bring the man the letter from Rome, from Persia, would bring him the letter. The man would read the letter and look at the letter and look with an eye of disdain at the companion. Look at him like he's a bum, riffraff, came out of the desert talk in a condescending way towards him. And that man was an apologetic. He was the Rasul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was always choosing the right people to send to these people. So the shahid, the point is, they spread al-Islam in a way that was miraculous. One of the proofs of his nubuwa is how his religion spread. So Imam al-Bayhaqi in his book Dalal al nubuwa he brought that issue, the fact that Al-Islam spread far and wide, everywhere, and it will continue to spread, is a sign that Allah promised him, and Allah Azza wa Jal, he doesn't break his promise, instead he keeps his promise. So that's one of the major benefits of social media. Almost anybody is in a position to give dawah in Allah, and dawah Allah means a lot. It means refuting people who deserve to be refuted. It means explaining and making the bayan of what Al-Islam is saying. It can be making the munaqasha and having discussion and having debates with people. Many, many ways. So this is something that is unprecedented in the history of Beni Adam. Another tremendous benefit. In the years previously, a student of knowledge in Al-Islam, he wants to develop for himself a library where he purchases books because you can't perform your jihad without your weapons, so you have to buy a lot of books. And the Islamic library is endless. If you just wanted to buy books of fiqh, that's it. Just fiqh. Fiqh of this madhab, that madhab, this madhab. Fiqh that's comparative, contemporary fiqh. If you just wanted to fill up this room with the books of fiqh, this room is not enough. If you put the rufuf or the bookshelves all around these walls right here, it won't be enough. You'll have more books left that can fit into this room. So that's how it used to be in the past. You have to spend a lot of money gathering up these books. Wherever you travel, wherever you move, you have to travel with those books. You have to pack them up. You have to move with those books. It's not like that anymore. Due to the internet and the technology that's available, a person can just have something very small and he'll have in that thing all of the kutub of the sitta. With social media, right now, I want to look for a hadith. You people are sitting right there. The person who's given the talk. In the past, he could say anything. He could say this hadith is there, this hadith is there. And the people in the audience, all they can do is write it down and remember if they remember to check it later on. Doesn't like that right now. He goes straight to social media, straight to the internet. So whatever hadith is you looking for, innamal amalu binniyat. I want to know where it is. All I have to do is put first few words. All I have to do is put one word of that hadith. And at my very fingertips, I have over 30, 40, 50,000 hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even for people who don't speak Arabic, it's like that in English. You want any ayat of the Qur'an. All you have to do is write in English, transliteration, tibyan. You're looking for the ayat with the word tibyan, you spell it out in English, and it's right there at your fingertips. So that's the benefit of the internet and the benefit of all of this 
technology and this explosion that the Prophet ﷺ prophesies that one of the signs of the hour is that writing, knowledge, information is going to be more. Right now it is in a way that was unimaginable back then. And in that hadith we describe this ummah in the an ummah ummatun ummiya. This ummah is an ummah that is illiterate. Meaning the vast majority of Muslims, you bring them all together, many of them can't read and many of them can't write. So as a rahmah on them, Allah gave the people a religion that is comprehensive and it's easy to understand. It's not complicated. The more new knowledge you have, the more intelligent you are, the deeper insight you can have. But the religion in itself is not complicated. It's not complicated. So some of our brothers who are involved in fiqh, and you want to learn and be a new student in fiqh, and you're debating, should I take a medhab and I should learn that medhab or not? Our religion didn't make things complicated. You want to learn from a medhab? That's perfectly okay. Provided that you just don't complicate things for yourself because the madhahib can make things complicated with all of that information. Our religion is a simple religion. So the point of that is right now there's a lot of information that is available in Al-Islam where a person is in a position to learn his religion correctly and effectively. I told you about that book, The Ruling of Music in Islam is in English. There are a number of books that are on the internet where a person doesn't even have to buy books anymore for the most part. He doesn't even have to buy books because almost everything that he needs in almost every single science, there is something on that internet, something that's being shared in social media that made life easier, caused this big world to come closer now. So the world now is similar to a global village. Everybody is connected to the next person. And that's another one of the benefits of the internet. If our ummah is an ummah that he described, sallallahu alayhi wa the example of the Muslims to the Muslims is like the example of one body. Then social media puts us in a position where we know what's going on. Maybe the world did not report about what was happening in Burma and the oppression that was being exacted against the Muslims in Burma by priests, priests who are Buddhist priests, supposed to be spiritual people, leading the charge and killing people. Well, the Muslims were aware of that. But because of our weakness and so forth and so on, we don't have the ability to make the world come to know about it. But the point is, we were aware of it. We were aware of the suffering of the Chinese Muslims over there and so forth and so on. So the social media that people are using between themselves, it has effectively brought people together. And in coming together, there is a lot of benefit because that's the nature of this religion. Our religion is not a religion that encourages people to be isolated except in times of fitna. When it's more benefit, being by yourself, you go by yourself. But generally speaking, Muslims are social creatures. From the benefit as well, Ikhwani is, it helped us to save a lot of money. A lot of money. People can now Skype other people and you see and you talk to the person you are dealing with and it's not like it was 20 years ago. If you lived far away from your relatives in another country and you had to call them, that's all you had was the issue of calling. That's the old times. Now these kids, they can't even relate. I don't even think most of these kids have even seen cassettes that we used to listen to. You know, the cassette, you put it in the, you put it in the uh, radio and you press play and a cassette. And then when it cracks, you take some tape, you put it together and you rewind it with the pencil. If you were to show some of these kids a pencil inside of one of those two holes, you say, well, what is that? That's what it was before. We didn't know anything about CDs. So as being people from that generation back then, that is the nature of the dunya. It is always changing. If we don't change with it, it's going to leave us behind. Doesn't mean that you have to act like you some youngster, some teenager, 
and you try to hide all of the grays in your hair and you act immature and you get crazy haircuts and you dress in a crazy way. It's just that we have to be on top of these things so that we can be effective parents, we can be effective duat, we can be effective adults in our community to give some of these kids, inshallah, the advices that uh, they may be able to benefit as a result of our experiences. So there are a number of benefits from social media, a lot. So I'm not here to say social media is inherently evil and is bad. It has enhanced the lives of the Muslims. But it will give us an indication of how serious and how powerful the da'wah of the Nabi was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophets before them, and the difficulty that they used to have to go through in order to spread Islam. And they did it. And right now, with all of these apparatuses at our disposal, we only scratch the surface as it relates to our responsibility. But now we come to what is usually the reality of the social media and the lives of the vast majority of people except those people that Allah has mercy upon. The harms of it. One of the biggest harms is that it's a waste of time. It's very easy for a person to sit down and to become addicted to Facebook, for an example. He spends hours upon hours on Facebook. First thing he does when he wakes up in his morning, in the morning, is that he hits that Facebook. During the course of the day, he's on Facebook. At the end of the day, he's on Facebook. In schools in America, kids can't bring their telephones inside of the school because the smartphones are competing with the teacher when the teacher is educating this is why when you see those crazy things being filmed in america like students fighting fighting one another fighting the teacher the picture is never out in public where they're just taking the picture like that it's always below and they're hiding it because if you get caught with that phone in school it's going to be a problem some schools don't even allow you to bring it to the school because it is an issue that uh, compromises education. Any of you, if you've been to a Walima, Nikah lately, if you go to the Nikah, when our children go to the Nikah, we're sitting at the table, you'll find that at that table, people are not engaging with one another. I saw a WhatsApp um, message that said if the people were connected to the Quran, the way they were connected to WhatsApp or connected to Facebook or whatever the case may be as it relates to social media, then we would be like ulama. We would be like people from the awliya of Allah. But our connection to the Quran or that which will benefit us is not like the natural connection that people will have when they enjoy that type of al uh, when they're investigating and looking at uh, the uh, different social media platforms. So, it is a massive waste of time. So if a person finds himself addicted where he can't go at it at certain times and he's always or she's always doing it and it's taking up the bulk of the time, then the usage of that thing is now haram. The usage of that thing now is having a negative effect and impact and now you have to make some type of effort to get it under control. That you go on it in a way that is with discipline. Another terrible aspect and evil aspect of it is getting to know the evil people of the dunya. Not just the evil people of your city, your school, but the evil people of the dunya. Are the youngsters of Al-Islam in our community, are they radicalized by anything more than social media? So when people are using social media and they're being in communication with people who are filling their heads with crazy ideas, how many people have gotten in trouble from this method? And we know those people like ISIS, especially ISIS, and other groups and individuals like that, they are very prolific and very, very professional and in front of the curve as it relates to recruiting young people who are vulnerable through social media. So it becomes wajib upon the parent to be on top of that. It becomes wajib upon the parent to have something, and you can have it, where you know where your children are going when they surf the net, who are they talking to, and so forth and so on. 
There's some program on TV from the bad people who they meet. One of the groups is that individual who the police are always setting them up. The people on the other side of the computer are those individuals who want to have relationships with people under age. And they make a meeting, a meeting date and a meeting place. And the guy is 40, 45, 50, 29. And he knows that he's supposed to be talking to a girl who's 12, 13, under age. But it's the police who are setting him up. And then he goes to the house and they come in and they catch him. And he gives his excuse about he thought it was a hamburger place. And he didn't know. And then they run back all the things that transpired between what was said between the two of them. And the crazy thing is sometimes the parents go with the police to catch the guy. Or when the kid comes to the place where the meeting is, he finds his mother or his father there. And the mother's father is saying to him, how in the world can you put yourself in that position? You don't even know this person. You don't even know this person. This person will take you somewhere and you won't see the light of the sun after that. So you get an opportunity to meet the worst of the worst. The people who prey on kids and so forth and so on. So it is a dangerous place. Social media is dangerous. It can cost you your life and it's not a joke. And for any parent, that is more than enough to make the parent afraid that if he sleeps on the job, the result of that in the scale is his child can be taken away from him so i speak to the parents from amongst you don't allow your children to have free uninterrupted wholesale access to the internet and to social media you have to get yourself aware of that my grandmother is in her 90s she's really old and they put her in the old folks home convalescent home I told her, look, you have to go on Skype and all the way over here in the UK and you'll appreciate it when we start to talk. you see me and you'll like the discussion more. But because she's real, real old school, she said, I'm not going on that thing. She's afraid. She just doesn't want to deal with it. We can't be like that. The parent has to force himself to learn about some of the basics so that, again, he can know how to render some sites as being unaccessible. Meet the bad people on social media, on Facebook, all of that. The child is exposed to pornography. The child is exposed to cultures that are considered to be like outlaw underground cultures. The gothic way of thinking and the gothic way of living, all kind of craziness is out there. I mean craziness. People who alter the way that they look. People are putting tattoos in their eyeballs, right in their eyes. And they're encouraged. There's a culture on the internet about committing suicide where people are being bullied or people who have problems, mental problems, social problems, academic problems. They come, they establish a fraternity and they encourage and teach each other how to kill themselves. And the Muslim parent has no idea about what's going on. So many issues subcultures that only people who are, you know, they're not even really human. It's stuff that is shaitanic, things that we are not aware of, even. It's craziness. So the parents, we, parents, older people in our community, we have to be on top of this. And you young kids, you young people, you are playing with your lives as it relates to some of these sites and some of the things that you are into. It's uh, Really serious issue. In London a few weeks ago, there's a boy that I knew his family. He was born in Islam, raised in Islam. Parents were reverts. But like many of our youngsters, he was involved in the streets. Unfortunately, he was stabbed. And that was about a month ago now. They haven't released his body because... They have to do the autopsy. So when it first happened, it was a big problem. Is his family and his friends going to go and get revenge? They used social media to communicate with themselves about what they were going to do. So the police were looking at, uh, looking at what was going on and what was being said, and they went and arrested a gang of people, a load of people. So the social media is a problem. Your child can be involved with something. You don't know about it. 
It may not only cause him a problem, but the police come and knock your door down, and uh, it's a problem for the whole family. So this is something that is a crucial issue. Part of the problem as well with the issue of the Facebook is this thing of the private information that we share with people and social network, especially social media, especially the Muslim women, Muslim girls. It's not for the general public to come to know about any details about how old you are, where you were born, when you were born, what are your likes, what are your dislikes. You have to put as least amount of information on your Facebook as possible. And the people who you make your friends and your acquaintances, they have to be only women like you. Only people from your maharam, your uncles and your brothers and people like that. As for any and everyone having access to becoming your friend and talking to you and seeing you, this is something that is dangerous and it's something that is not permissible. This is a dangerous world out there and it is an issue where a person is uh, asking for trouble. There's another issue as well. And that is the issue of the people who put false information about themselves to mislead people. That's a form of lying, kevip. And it's only permissible to lie in Islam in three circumstances, and this is not one of them. If a person wants to put his name out there in a kunya, maybe people don't know who he is, but he's doing it for protection, not to make fitna and facade. He's doing it for protection. He just doesn't want people to know exactly who he is, but not because he wants to make fitna and facade. He just wants to remain anonymous, private, to the best of his ability. No problem with that. But taking on a name where people don't know who you are at all, and you're pretending to be someone else, this is something that is not permissible in El Islam. Also, the issue and the problem of spying on people. Spying on people. Not only spying on people, but uh, we have this thing that uh, many of these kids are aware of. Many people are dealing with the internet and social media where some people are actually out there and they're following an individual. Like the one who it used to be a long time ago. If you wanted to secretly follow someone, what did they call that again? Stalk them, to stalk them. You're looking at him from behind the bushes in front of his house. And you park on his street and you're watching him. And at certain times you go up to his window and you look in his window in his mailbox. So you're stalking him. So he has to go to the police and he has to get a restraining order against you. Don't come within 200, 300, 500 meters of this person, 500 feet. If you do, you're going to go to jail. Now, it's really easy to stalk people on the internet. Some of these people are experts when it comes to IT. They're experts. They can break into your stuff. They can even see you, see you when you think the camera is off. People have that level of expertise. So that type of stalking obviously is something that can't be done. It's haram. You can't spy on people. The ayat of the Quran is simple. Two simple words. Don't spy on each other. Don't spy on each other. Don't try to find out the aura and expose the aura of the Muslims. Anyone who does that, Allah will expose your own aura and it will be done in the inner recesses of your home. So spying on people is an issue that is not permissible. So there are many issues. Wasting time. The issue of meeting the nasty and the bad people. And I forgot about wasting time. Some of the games that some Muslim kids are addicted to, they are those games where you can shoot people up and you can play that game with people who are on the other side of the world. And some people, this is the job that they have. People gamble with it. People live for it. 
and the kid is inside his room hours upon hours and he's competing in some of these games that thing is not permissible for a person to spend all of that time playing those games whether it's by himself whether it's with his brother his friend right there in the privacy of his home or whether it's something that he's doing all of that time being wasted competing with people in some of these games that in themselves there's violence in it and things that are not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another thing ikhwani concerning the social media that is a big fitna and is one of the biggest fitna is the issue of the role that it plays with destroying people's aqidah and destroying people's akhlaq as it relates to the aqidah everybody is out there everyone who has something to say is out there the one who wants to curse the companions he's out there and he wants to debate everyone the one who is out there and he wants to believe in craziness and nonsense that's against the religion of Islam, he's out there. So it's not advisable that people who are not competent, qualified, that you begin to debate with these individuals because it is possible you yourself can go astray. Your aqidah can get jammed up if you were to meet the wrong person who overpowers you in this speech because of the shubahat that he has. From the issue of Aqidah with that thing is, as well, big problem when people go to perform Umrah, to perform an Hajj. That is a strictly Ibadah-oriented activity. To go to the house of Allah to get your sins removed from you, inshallah, to worship Allah. So the person who has Twitter, for an example, has Twitter, and he takes pictures of himself about, okay, I'm here today, I'm doing this today, I'm doing that. If the goal and the objective was really just to let people know back home, I'm okay. To let people back home know, hey, look at this. I didn't know Muzdalifah was like this. I didn't know Arafat was like this. This is what the Kaaba looks like when you're right here. Okay, and that kind of issue, then it's understandable to a certain degree. But some of the pictures that the people take, they are pictures that compromise the ikhlas that a person should have when he goes. And it's almost impossible during today's time for an individual to say, I'm going to go and perform Umrah. And when I perform Umrah Hajj, I'm not taking any pictures. It's almost impossible. Because that's the culture we, that we're living in right now. People expect it from you. The people you left behind. And to go over there and not to keep in touch with the people is something that's uh, really difficult. But if you do find yourself performing al-hajj or al-umrah, let that be an issue that uh, you take great concern about because, again, it can be an issue where an individual's hajj or umrah and all of the efforts and money that he put forward will be thrown back at him, yom al-qiyam. In the past, look how the world has changed. In the past, all you had 20, 30 years ago, all you had was the Bedouin man there with the camel. And you just get on top of the camel at Masjid Qiblatayn that doesn't have any meaning in Islam. And you get on top of the camel at Masjid Qiblatayn and he takes a picture of you with an old Kodak camera. And then you pay a dollar, two, two reals, five reals for it. You bring that back and you say, this is the Hajj that I performed. That's all you had 15, 20 years ago. That was old school, a long time ago. So you have to take that picture right there and you got to get that blown up and then you go crazy. But it was old school technology. Now it's not like that. Right now at this very moment from the beginning of your waking day to the end of that particular day, you have the ability to take pictures. And as I mentioned, the equipment, social media, the internet, it has the hukum, the ruling of what it's being used for what is being used for? What we have known, the seriousness of the accident when the crane fell down in Mecca, the Kaaba, if that hadn't been on the internet, there in the Masjid al-Haram, they have the CCTV system, so they captured it. People who had access to that sent it out to the world, and we saw those horrific pictures and images which is another issue the issue of watching things on the internet and social media that go against the religion like the violence that's there 
whether it's Muslims killing Muslims or Muslims being killed by non-Muslims, people being slaughtered, these types of issues in Al-Islam, these are not things that we should be watching. It causes a person's heart to die, to see other human beings. The kid is at the cash register. Yarhamakullah. He's at the cash register about to pay for something. A lady who looked like she's in her 70s. She has white hair. She's the next in line. No connection. But it seemed like she got too close to him. You can't hear any discussion or dialogue. Seemed like he didn't like her getting too close. He turned around and literally knocked that old lady out. Knocked her out. Punched her right in the face and knocked her out. Who wants to send that to somebody else? Something's wrong. To send that to someone else. Now you want to send it to your friend to say, look how bad things have gotten with Benny Adam. And you know how he is. Okay, we may can say, okay, I can see that. But just to send that out wholesale, that's a problem. That's a problem. We shouldn't spread those types of images. But again, this is the time that we live in. I saw a WhatsApp thing, the WhatsApp thing. It had a man, like a cartoon. The man was drowning in the water. The water was over his head and his hand was up like this. And the water's over his head. And you can see the word at the top of the water by his head. Help, help, help. And there were about seven people on the land and they all had their cameras out filming the man. That's our generation right now. That if something happens between people before the person makes an amr bil ma'roof or a nahyu an al munkar the people today will let that thing happen and just take out their phones and they will watch it now i'm not telling anybody to jump in the middle of any and everything that happens because we're living in a crazy time people will take weapons out and you lose your life and allah ta'ala doesn't burden you behind your scope but our religion tells us you shouldn't be people just standing around and do nothing when people are being abused and there's fitting and facade. You have the ability to stop it or put the best construction to it. This is something that should, that, that, that should be done. So the way, and the shahid is, the way that these things have become, Hwani, is more fitna, is more harm than it is in terms of benefit. Last thing that I want to mention before we do our Q&A session, inshallah. Is religiously some of the things that we pass out and we circulate, some of the things that we believe in, we are showing our level of immaturity and lack of knowledge because we believe in almost anything. And when it comes to social media, it's very easy because many things are photoshopped, many things are not even real. You have to get things and you have to look at it and you have to be skeptical, suspicious. People have to prove to you before you believe it. There is a site that I would like to tell you if you didn't know about. This site, it is called Sloan. S-L-O-A-N. Sloan.com. Any video that is out, any video that is out, and it seems miraculous. It seems, you know, extraordinary. All you have to do is go to this site over here and put that video in where it's asking you for the information and it's going to tell you, is this a hoax? Is it real? Is it fake? And there are a lot of things that are just not real. Things that uh, we believe in just because we see it right away. We see it. But if you were to take your time, you can see this thing is not real. And every day these things are being spread. And in our religion, we're not supposed to spread falsehood. Intentionally or unintentionally. You know those guys in London who protect Buckingham Palace? I think they call them beef eaters or something like that. The guy who stands there straight all day with the big hat and the red jacket, suit, he doesn't move. Do you guys know those guys? They're beef eaters, right? Or are the beef eaters at the Tower of London? Where, which one is it? Hey, are you guys with me or are you sleeping? Those guys with the big red, with the big black hats and the red thing at Buckingham Palace. Those guards, they're not supposed to move. 
they had some guy messing with one of them and dancing in front of him, as many people do, because they try to make him smile, try to make him move in their job, they're trained to be real serious. That's part of the tourist attraction that people go to see. But it showed that the guard, he got upset, and he turned, he punched the guy, and he knocked him out. And then he stood up again. If you were to look at that, the first time, it shocks you, and you say, wow, God, that guard, look what happened. But if you rewind it, if you were to rewind it and you were to look at it, you would see it's just a hoax. People put that together. And this is the time that we're living in. Now, why is this important? It's important, obviously, because Islam is the religion of the truth. We only spread the truth. But it's also very important in that the stage is being set for the Dajjal. If people can be easily fooled and duped by these things, and this stuff is easy, being photoshopped, different angles, this stuff is easy, then surely when a Dajjal comes on the scene, he will come on the scene and the people are like the chicken that's been stuffed. He's been given a lot of food, ready for the slaughter. Because the people right now, their standards of what's authentic, what, I, what do I believe in, what I won't believe, is very low. So we believe in almost any and everything. You have to look at that stuff three and four and five times and don't be so quick to pass it out because it's not in consistency with the religion to pass out that which is not authentic. So now the Adhan is going to be, inshallah, in seven minutes, I think they told me or something like that, or at 9.30, bi'idhnillah. If your brothers have any questions, any comments, anything like that, you can put your questions forward right now, your comments or any taswibat. For ahlin wa sahlin. Alindakum shay? تفضل يا أخي. Television. Television. Is it permissible to have a television in your house? Television is like we said. The ruling of the TV is according to what it's being used for. If it's being used for what is beneficial, what is mustahab, what is having faida in it, then inshallah ta'ala is no problem. If it's being used for what is not permissible and so forth and so on, then it shouldn't be there. And that's the case with the vast majority of uh, the people, Muslims and non-Muslims. TV is a, um, ala, a piece of equipment that makes us waste time and get more sins than we get benefit for the most part. Keep in mind that there are some ulama of Islam who said that TV altogether is haram for many different reasons. But inshallah, the TV is permissible depending upon what it's being used for. And Allah knows best. Anything, anybody else? Anybody else? Nah, akhi. What about recording the incidents like using the system? Recording what, akhi? Yeah, as it relates to recording people, people being violent with you, people are threatening you, or you're in a situation where you want to get proof on your side because there's some imminent danger or potential danger, then it is intelligent for you to record that so that you'll have proof if you go to court, if you go to the police. But recording people without their knowledge in order to make fit and facade is something that's not permissible. Can't record people and they don't know that you're recording them. You're just on the bus and you're recording someone just to be, that's his private space. Can't do like that. He's entitled not to be recorded if he doesn't know. Calling someone on the telephone and recording your discussion without his knowledge is not permissible. Something you shouldn't do. Calling someone on the telephone and someone else is listening with you and the other side doesn't even know about that. Not something that you should do. So if you're going to record it because there's a potential threat to you. You're on the train, it's late at night, and you have some people on the train who are drunk. And the way that they're acting is rambunctious and they're really getting out of control. You sense this is going to be a problem. So you start recording it for your own safety, by all means. This is part of taking precautions. No problem with that. Ahi Abdul Hay. Now the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentioned Ida Khala Rajulun bim raatin kana shaitanu tharifuhuma if a man and a woman were alone together in the room, then shaitan is the third between them. 
So if an individual is corresponding with a lady from the opposite sex who is not from those women who he's a mahram for that individual, that's considered to have the hukum of the khalwa, the ruling of the khalwa, although they're not in the same room. Because they're practically in the same room. They're in the same room through the Skype. They're in the same room as a result of the connection that happened. And as we told you, these internet, social media, all of this issue, it is called the ittisalat and the mawasala, the connection that has taken place as a result of the technology. So they are connected. So it has the same ruling. Good question, Akhi Abdul Hay. Tafaddi, Ya Sheikh. Now, for the people who use CCTV, and as a result of the usage of CCTV, some people, without their knowledge, they get recorded. What does El Islam say about that? It's in the privacy of your own home, and that's your property right there. The fact that someone inadvertently walked by is not your issue, it's not your problem. Plus, the person who is walking by, he's only walking by for a few seconds. So if he's there for longer than a few seconds, he's doing something he shouldn't be doing. He's on your private property. So the benefit that comes as a result of having CCTV and with it, you catch people just passing by for a few seconds. You, you, you invaded their privacy for, to, a, to a certain degree. Because who's invading whose privacy? He's passing by your house. So you have the right to privacy too. But it's a public passageway. So the benefit that comes as a result of having CCTV and that thing outweighs the harm. It outweighs the harm that you captured this individual for a few seconds and he didn't know about it. The CCTV that's not permissible is the CCTV where you strip people of the right for privacy. Like in our message right now, there's no CCTV in the private personal area of the sisters. At the door, there's CCTV to see who came and came out. But if something were to happen inside of the masjid on their side, Allah forbid, we would have to piece the th situation together. We have to, who came in and who went out and about what time and who were the witnesses that was there. But it's unlike this part of the, part of the masjid where we got the guy trying to break into the sadaqah box. We found what he did. We saw the guy who was going into people's jackets, taking their mobile phones. And, and maybe he wanted to make Umar bin Maruf and then Munkar. He was taking the people's mobile phone and he was on the CCTV. We caught him because here were men and we don't have that level of privacy that women have as it relates to their aura. All of the woman is the aura, so you don't find the CCTV in there invading their privacy. Tfadl ya akhi, Sheikh, tfadl. To do what? To post them? It's better to avoid all of that. There's no benefit of it. Obviously, if a person feels that pictures is haram, picture taking, picture making is haram, then obviously you can't do that. Obviously, but if a person feels that picture taking is not haram and he believes that based upon proofs and delil, he believes that he took that position. There were an imam who took that position and he wants to post something in the way of an image, whether it's a selfie or other than that. If there's some benefit that's going to come to the people, like we saw again when the people had the accident, some of the people who got sick there at Hajj got sick. They would take pictures to show the level of their wounds to their family back home. Here's a selfie. This is what happened to me. But the way it is right now, it's more of a waste of a time, recreational type thing. Any more questions? Ikhwani fillahi, tafadl ya Now, I'm concerning following celebrities, following celebrities. There's not a single celebrity in the face of the earth except that no matter what he did in terms of his accomplishments on and while he is engaged in his sport or in what he's doing, no matter how nice the person happens to be, there are certain things about that individual that the people know about. 
So really, celebrities shouldn't be the heroes for Muslims. and shouldn't be the examples for the Muslims. I mentioned and gave you guys a few examples about the old school and the olden days growing up. My hero number one at the top of the list was Muhammad Ali. Because he was a man of substance. He used to stand by what he believed in. And he used to suffer as a result of that. And he was extremely brave in what he told the people in public. And he used to back that up in the ring and the way that he was dealing with people. But even with that being the case, that high level where he's probably the single most well-known personality during that time. Now with social media, it's easy for that guy who plays soccer right now. What's the soccer player's name? Anybody know what's his name? You all know I'm talking about Messi. You all know I'm talking about Messi. Messi, Ronaldinho, those guys like that, they're well known because they're good, but because of social media as well. They have over a million people following them. Muhammad Ali, had he had this stuff to his, at, his, at his fingertips, Allah knows best. People probably would know about him, people, whoever's up on the moon and all of that because he was on that level. But the point is, there were things about his personal life that as a Muslim, we can't condone that and we can't support that. And everybody is like that. Everybody is like that. So therefore, those people are not our heroes. And those are not the type of people that we go after. Trying to, I mean, it's interesting. Famous, wealthy, some of them are powerful. So naturally, there's an inclination. I want to know. I want to know more about them. But uh, if a person was really preoccupied with higher issues, like how do I... Myself, how do I become famous? And what do I do to become famous to help the world? Whatever what it's going to be, that will benefit me more than wasting time looking for. So, this is something that uh, we shouldn't go after. We shouldn't be trying to uh, waste time learning about these people. A lot of times, those people as well, they have a lot of issues we have no idea about that. Some of them, I won't say they wish they were in our, our shoes. But we don't know the drama that they have to deal with. Okay, ikhwani fillahi, we're going to stop here, inshallah ta'ala. We want to remind you brothers and you sisters as well that tomorrow is a continued program of the issue of some of the kabair. And as it was announced today after Salat al-Jum'ati, tomorrow is going to do with, deal today, tomorrow is going to be dealing with uquq al-walideen disobeying the parents. One of the biggest kabira from the kabaiyas. May Allah Ta'ala make us all barim to our parents and may accept it from us and you. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. So I'm going to... Hey, my man, did you send that thing to my email? Yeah, I sent it to you. You sent it today? Yeah, no, I sent it to you maybe two days ago. No, today I said you got to send it again. Because oh, you know I'm checking I my email like that. I didn't have your email address and I gave it to the brother Abu Isa. Oh. And he was going to do it on behalf because uh, maybe 